Yeah. Hello. Hello. How are we doing tonight? Great. Okay, so I'm the first investor in Yoko and was asked to speak about my journey. Um, and I would like to share a little bit about, it actually leads on to nicely from Shemaine, who's by the way going to be my future neighbor, which I'm very excited about <laughs> in Yoko North. Um, so I want to take you on a brief journey, how I figured out my priorities in life um, and how that's reflected in some of the projects that I've been working on um, and how it also ultimately led me to Yoko. So I'm going to take you back to my undergraduate. I studied environmental engineering, went into it with a passion for changing the world, making it a greener place. Now. What I learned shortly was that the biggest employer for environmental engineers is the oil and gas industry. It pays the highest salaries, it's just the most desirable job apparently in the space of environmental engineering. And so because I was doing well at school, they kind of tempted me with, hey, here's a scholarship, would you like a scholarship? And I was like, yeah, I'll take free money. And they're like, would you like to do an internship for me? And I was like, okay, I can do an internship. It's not going to define my career. Um, but I had a f strange feeling about it. And so I did the internship. I flew to, I worked on an offshore drilling rig between Norway and Iceland in the North Atlantic, drilling horizontal oil wells. And uh, so following this internship, I received a job offer which was probably the best job offer you could get at the time. It was the highest paying salaries, risk bonuses included because you live in the ocean. Um, and, uh, and I was thinking about it. Now, while I was thinking about it, something happened. This happened. Who recalls the Gulf, the, oops, sorry. Who recalls the Gulf of Mexico blowout? This was the company that offered me the job was operating this oil rig, British Petroleum. And this led me to think deeply about what do I actually care about? Do I want to take this job? And it led to a bit of a journey of introspection of what do I want to do? I remember this very well when I told my friends in my, in my university, I'm not going to take the job. Everyone was like, oh my God, what the fuck are you doing? You're turning out the best job offer you can get. And I just realized over time, it, it wasn't my dream to work on oil and gas platforms. My dream was the opposite, to stop oil and gas from existing and hopefully helping us transition to a better and greener future. And so it was about the same time that I remember I went to a talk, um, which was by successful entrepreneurs. I always wanted to become an entrepreneur. And um, someone, and I spoke to an entrepreneur who'd worked on his project for eight years, successfully exited, and was thinking about what to do next. And I asked him, how do you choose what to work on? Like, how do you choose what's, you know, what's worth taking a job for and what's not worth taking a job for? And I remember he told me, and it stuck with me, he told me, my experience of doing a startup, I look at projects like this. Can I see myself spending my professional life for the next 10 years on this course? Do I feel strongly enough about this to spend 10 years pushing whatever I'm pushing? And that really stuck with me and it left a mark and I started to think about my priorities and what I want to work on in this way. Because truly, if you think about it, 10 years professional life, which is basically most of what we do if we don't sleep, um, there's not so many things you can do in your life, like maybe two, three of those, they might be unsuccessful. Um, and so I kind of, it led to a process of introspection and figure out my priorities, just like Charmaine said. Um, and uh, the best that I could come up with, and this is really a continual process, uh, was that the topics that really truly me touch me, and I see them throughout my whole life coming back again and again, is... Our global ecology, which is essentially our global planet that we only have one of, as well as building a community to give back and help others around me. And so this kind of became the theme of my many different projects. Um, I won't have time to go into all of them. This is just a fraction, but uh, I'm going to take you on a short journey of a few projects that I did. 
um, from mangroves to heart sensors to, um, to working on what's referred to as the dumbest problem in the world, and ultimately how it led me to Yoko. So, uh, my first step was uh, pursuing a PhD. I strongly felt like technology has the ability to really accelerate some of the things, some of the, basically a transition that I wanted to see. Um, and so I pursued a, tech, a PhD in the field of printed electronics, so 3D printing metal sensors, which are hazardous materials. I was working with copper, silver, and gold nanoparticles. Um, and so this was my work outfit, uh, not very comfortable. Um, and uh, so just as a, oh, this is what it looks like. So this is, if it works, if it works. No? Is it? Okay, so this is printing of electronics, like magic. Electric tracks appear. So this was the technology that I worked on and I researched for a bunch of years. I'm not going to go into uh, how it works, although I would love to. Um, but um, I'm going to talk about some of the applications of this type of technology that excited me because they're related to ecology, they're related to giving up, giving back to others. So, no. <laughs> so, let's go back to the slides. There we go. Okay. Fast forward eight years, one of the exciting technologies that after years of research was developed from this, so essentially it's a printed sensor. And so, um, this project, actually, Christian talked yesterday about the Caribbean and some of the you know, challenges the Caribbean is facing. This is in the Bahamas. Um, the Caribbean as a region is, is extremely affected by global warming and climate change as a consequence. And so uh, in 2019, there was a hurricane called Dorian, which wiped out 67% of the mangroves in one of the islands in the Bahamas that I was working on, Grand Bahama. So that's 10,000 hectares, which is about 100 times Yoko North and South together, completely wiped out. Which, anyway, for so many reasons, it was terrible. And so I got involved with a reforestation project um, where we were able to use printed sensor technology. So we would implement them randomly into a sample of mangroves that we were planting, like this one, essentially to trace and track and monitor the regrowth of this mangrove forest through what's called remote sensing. So people don't need to walk in the mangroves, which is extremely bad. Every step you take, you're releasing methane. Um, so basically, sensors are attached to small mangroves. Drones fly over the mangroves and pick up what's going on uh, and understand, l learn more about the recovery of the ecosystem. So this is one of the applications. Um, the next one, was the next video. Now, who here has heard of stem cells before? A lot of people, very cool. So, for those of you who haven't, stem cells are essentially the building block of our human bodies. They're amazing cells that can turn into any body cell, apart from brain cells. And how do you turn them into any body cell? You feed them proteins that will turn them into, so depending on what proteins you feed them to, they will turn into any body cell. And so um, this project was in my research group going on. It was on printing organs, specifically hearts. And so this was together with a friend. We fed some of these stem cells, the proteins that turn them into cardiovascular cells, meaning heart cells. And so the... Uh, well, I guess the evidence that this worked was that these contin um, spontaneous contractions that you saw, which are the same as in a heart. So, the sensors that I printed, we were able to use to pick up the electrical signal that these stem cells, these heart cells at this point, um, 
put out. And so basically it's a heart rhythm sensor at this point. Fast forward eight years, um, this technology is now being, uh, so I'm running a research project right now with a couple of different universities um, where, so we work on patients with heart rhythm irregularities. Does anyone here know someone who has heart rhythm irregularities? I do. I am not surprised. It's about 5% of the global population. Uh, the way it's currently treated or monitored is you take all of these sensors on your body, you go to a hospital, spend 24 hours there. Cardiologists literally look at the data, take out a ruler to make sense of the data. This is not representative of reality or anything we do in our normal lives. So uh, what this research eventually led to is um, we are now developing a printed heart sensor uh, which is wearable. You only need to replace the battery once a month. Um, it sends the signal to your phone. You go about your daily life. It measures your heart rhythm throughout your normal everyday life. Uh, and if there's a potentially dangerous situation, you'll be alerted as well as your doctor. Um, so I was very happy to see some applications coming out of many hours and many days spent in a research lab. Uh, that contributed to something I care about. This project now we just got funded. We are running in UCSF and University of Missouri um, and with a bunch of hospitals. This kind of got me interested in one way of helping people and helping people through community, uh, which is to do with human health. I think helping someone who is sick or ill or terribly ill is a very obvious and direct way of helping someone. And so this eventually, through uh, roller coasters of different startups, led me to one of my startups called CrowdMed, where we work on unresolved medical cases. Does anyone here have someone in their family who has an unresolved medical case? Meaning they go from doctor to doctor and no one really figures out what is actually going on. Also, I'm not surprised to see hands. This is extremely common. Um, patients, so um, the reason why we have so many unresolved medical cases, there's a bunch of reasons, diagnostic errors, many, many more, but the one that I really think is the one that stands out to me is a misalignment in incentives in the general healthcare system. So what do I mean by that? Misaligned incentives. What do doctors get paid for? Treatments. Performing treatments or you know, surgery maybe gives them even more money. So, um, you know, essentially, if I have a medical problem, uh, what do I do? I think about what is the symptom that I'm experiencing the strongest. I go to the doctor that I consider to be in the realm of this symptom. If I have back pain, I might go to see a physiotherapist, maybe. Although the true reason of what I'm actually experiencing might be somewhere completely different. Now the doctor in their mind goes through a list, a catalog of treatments that they offer, and if none of them make sense, sorry, I can't help you. You need to go to the next doctor. Try someone else. And so patients go from doctor to doctor and not get helped. Anyway, so um, how do we uh, help patients like this, which are patients that are suffering a lot? We do it through what I would call the power, the wisdom of crowds, of communities. So we, over the years, have built a community of 35,000 people. Um, some of them have medical backgrounds. Some of them are doctors, some nurses, medical students, but also non-medical backgrounds. So anyone, even anyone here, if they would like, can join and we um, present these medical cases to this community of 35,000 people who collectively try and figure out what's really going on with these cases. And so this is a vast background of experiences, of insights in life, of different doctors. Um, why do people do it? They do it because main reason is altruism, which is beautiful. People ultimately want to help other people. And there's a whole bunch of other reasons. 
doctors enjoy the challenge of being exposed to these very challenging medical cases. It's a little bit like Dr. House or Diagnosis, if anyone has seen the Netflix series. Actually, it's exactly like Diagnosis, but we have scaled it into an automated platform. Um, uh, so basically what we, what we um, created is a platform where doctors can collaborate on these cases, exchange ideas, discuss different ideas. We have a gamification aspect of how we gamify altruism. So there's a ranking and there is a reputation and point systems. And the, the, someone, whoever solves the most medical cases uh, is at the top of the ranking. So we try to gamify altruism. There's a cash component as well, but it's success-based. If you actually figure out someone's diagnosis or you significantly contribute towards it, you will get cash. And so, how does that work? How, how um, you know, can we solve these medical cases? So far, in the last eight years of us existing, we have solved two out of three of these cases that come to us. And these are cases that, these are really the worst of the worst cases that come to us. People suffer greatly, otherwise they wouldn't be looking for a weird solution like we are, right? Like something that's completely outside of the medical system. And so, why does it work? Um, or, okay, like, I mean, there's so many reasons I can tell you so much more about this, but um, just to kind of pinpoint a few, we find a ton of rare diseases. Now, that makes a lot of sense because no doctor can know all diseases, especially not all rare diseases, and spot them correctly. If you go to one doctor, they probably can't. If you see five, you still have a pretty bad shot at it. So, Whereas if you're exposed to 35,000 doctors, or a lot of them doctors, you have a much better chance at it, that someone will recognize what you have. And so this is one of the reasons that it works. We have a lot of rare diseases. The other shocking thing we find is non-rare diseases, very commonly understood illnesses like Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a very interesting one. Does anyone here, have, has anyone ever had Lyme disease? No. Okay. It is a disease that's transmitted by a tick, and by a tick bite, and it is completely understood and completely harmless if spotted and understood within the first six months of contracting this disease. If unspotted, it can ultimately be deadly. People die from this. And the reason why we see so many Lyme diseases that we correctly diagnose, for us it becomes easy because you see a repetition of these cases, but why does the, like the, the conventional medical system fail to see them? It's because the, the, um, the symptoms are all over the place. It's a very complicated disease that affects your body and all kinds of weird body parts. And so again, doctors don't have the incentive to take a step back to get people to collaborate, to speak to people with different specializations and get everyone together. This actually, as a general forum, where doctors collaborate, there's only one use case in the world which is established, which is what's called a tumor board. So tumor board only convenes if there's a diagnosis of cancer and people discuss what's the best treatment to take from here for this patient. So you get a radiologist, you get an oncologist, all kinds of doctors. Um, but at the diagnosis level, it doesn't exist other than us. Um, so it's completely absent. Um, so anyway, this, I wanted to share just this with you because I see it as a very powerful example of the wisdom and the power of communities that are ultimately driven by altruism. We have a cash component, but people don't do it for that. People do it because they want to help each other. And it's a very gratifying thing um, to help someone else alleviate their suffering. Um, okay, on to the next. This started as a side project, um, and it started from me moving to the United States. Who here lives or spends a lot of time in the U.S.? Okay, quite a few people. So this picture is probably somewhat familiar to you. What do you see? I see a sunset, I see a road, and I see a lot of homelessness at the side of the road. When I, I moved to the US because I was doing a bunch of startups and you just have the best access to venture capital in the US. The US is the richest country in the world. In fact, I moved to the geography within the US, the Bay Area, that has created the most wealth in the history of humankind. And I arrive and I live in San Francisco and I find 
myself walking past, walking past homeless people on a daily basis going to work. And I was like, this is not right. How does this make any sense? And, you know, what started as just kind of frustration um, led to, I, I observed my friends who were living with me in San Francisco. And uh, I felt like most people, the way they function is they completely block it out. They just like, these people don't exist. They are not part of my society or my community. They are others. They are, yeah. Um, I didn't want to do that. It's just, I, I'm, I just felt a resentment towards that attitude. And I felt like, I need to do something. Come on, I live here. How can I just walk past these people every day like this? I started researching a little bit about homelessness. Homelessness was just mentioned as a topic that some of us really care about. And my conclusion of reading into this was, what's the true reason for homelessness? Well, it's a long list of failure with people ending up in these situations as kind of the final piece of the puzzle, with failures from a federal level, state, local, healthcare systems, mental support, uh, social services, at all levels, housing policies, um, it's a failure. And so, actually going back to what Shemaine was talking about, um, you know, these are very big problems. How can I influence, I don't know, any of them? Doesn't feel like I can. Um, so, what does that mean? I, I do nothing, I just walk past these people that, you know, live in these conditions every day to work. Um, so I asked myself the question, what can I do today? What is something that I can do today to help them a little bit? The best thing that I came up with was food handouts. So, initially it started just me and my friends. Um, once a week would cook a big soup and then go downtown and hand out food. It was actually a very interesting experience. Many things I learned, um, I mean, I, you know, well, handing out food, I mean, food is such a primary thing. You suddenly have this moment of connection with someone who's completely alienated in society. Um, you humanize that person for that one brief moment. And that's felt really meaningful. And I noticed it felt meaningful to others around me as well. When I would tell my friends what I'm doing, they would be like, oh, that's amazing, can I please come and help? And I was like, yeah, sure, I, this is limited what I can do. Um, so, you know, a bunch of my friends came together and it just became a weekly thing. And we had, I mean, it was, it was um, it, you know, it, it felt good to every, and the irony, I mean, another thing that I learned was like, you're helping someone out for a brief moment the irony is, you're helping yourself as well. It feels good to help others. It feels rewarding, it feels like it gives you a purpose, it gives you meaning. You're almost doing it more for, no, I don't want to say it. you're doing it for both, but it's just a nice side effect that really encourages people to take up all kinds of volunteer work and philanthropic work. And so, it was still a side project at this point. Once a week we'd get together, cook soup, and hand it out. It was very fun. Um, one afternoon, I went to a bagel shop, I remember this, just before it closed on a Friday. And I'm buying a bagel and I see them empty the shelves and put all the bagels in a big bag. And I was like, oh, where does that go? What happens with this? And they're like, well, we bake overnight, we sell what we can during the day, and then we have to throw away the rest. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I was like, can I have it? Because I'm handing out food regularly to homeless people. And they're like, yeah, sure. So they hand me this bag. This was the first bag that I picked up that was about to be thrown away. It was 73 bagels, I counted them. I was like, this is going to waste? Are you kidding me? Like, these were baked this morning. You can probably eat them for like four days. Um, and so I was like, okay, now I have this bag of 73 bagels. What do I do with it? So I called up a bunch of food banks, and uh, it was very difficult to donate them to a food bank or a shelter, because turns out, as I learned, most food banks don't take perishable food items. They don't want to take the risk of the liability of the item being, I don't know, giving someone food poisoning or something. And I was like, this is stupid. So in this specific case, on the first day, I was like, okay, 
I'm not going to throw these away. I want to give them to homeless people or people who need them. Uh, so I sat down again with a bunch of friends and turned them into 73 cream cheese bagels. Um, and again, went, down, went downtown and, and handed it out to homeless people. Anyway, this kind of inspired me to think a little bit more about what I was seeing. Because I clearly noticed I can pick up this kind of food easily every day. I can go back to the same bagel shop and pick up 70 bagels every single day. And, you know, how, how, like, anyway, so I started researching this a little bit more. It was still a side project. It was still kind of a weekend activity. Um, and as I learned more about it, I discovered more about what people refer to as the dumbest problem in the world. Who recognizes this? Chris. It is the Camp Nou in Barcelona. The biggest football soccer stadium in the world. It can host 100,000 people. What I learned as I dove deeper into this was in the US alone, food is thrown away, and this is perfectly edible food. This is not food scraps from events like tonight that we might feed to Lola or someone else, throw away. Perfectly edible food, completely fine to eat. If you add up all the food that Justin alone has thrown away every day, you could fill up this stadium to the very top. And you can certainly feed all homeless people and people in need, as a matter of fact. In fact, in the US, it's probably, I mean, this, this happens in every country in the world. In the US, it's a little bit more extreme than the other countries because the US, while having a massive surplus of food, so US has three times the amount of food that it needs to sustain its population and its food system. Yet there are 60 million people who rely on food handouts every day in the US. 60 million, that is 12 times the, the population of Costa Rica. And all of this food goes to waste. As I, you know, I mean, there's many components to this. There's the human component of, there's a, there's a kind of an equity component of this is food that, you know, that should be distributed in a fair way. Um, there's also an environmental component to it. Most of the food lands in landfills and produces a lot of methane. If you add up all the food waste in the world uh, and compare the, the greenhouse gas effect of this food waste to countries, it would be the third biggest in the world after China and the US. This is the scale of the problem. And to me, when I found the description, the dumbest problem in the world, I was like, that just, I mean, it's just, like, it's like I felt the obligation to do something about it. So this was still at this point a side project. I started getting more into it. I started, you know, being more interested in what's going on. So what what did that lead me to do? Um, so first thing was I started a nonprofit because a lot of the food banks that I was trying to work with and shelters were just not taking the food that's really easily accessible that would be thrown away. So I incorporated a 501c3. Um, I um, found out after a while, which I found really interesting, at this point it was still kind of a non-profit idea. Um, having done a bunch of startups before, I became interested if there isn't some kind of for-profit aspect here as well. Can we actually like find that unique niche of creating a company that creates value as well as actually does something good that I feel very strongly about? And so what I discovered was most businesses nowadays pay for their food disposal. This is the most expensive type of food disposal. Well, if they donate it, in many countries, including the US, Canada, Italy, France, um, they can actually get a tax deduction for this donation because a lot of countries allow donations not just to be money, but also goods. So you could donate a car, someone estimates the value of the car, and it gets deducted from your taxes. And so the same applies to food. You can donate food. And this is, this is for businesses that operate in supermarkets and restaurants, a much bigger problem, like much bigger cost and potential saving. Um, they can actually save money from donating food, which most of them didn't know. At this point, I was like, okay, I'm onto something here, hopefully. Um, and uh, well, long story short, I, as of recently, added it to a list of my current projects. Uh, I raised a bunch of venture capital for it, and I'm now scaling it 
into a platform where we hope to alleviate hunger and, and solve food insecurity, which is so dumb because the food is there. Um, and so, anyway, many, many learnings along the way. For me, the main one was like humanizing other people that are part of our society and usually left out is an incredibly valuable thing. Uh, I saw the power of altruism yet again after CrowdMed in this case. Literally every single one of my friends was like, how can I help? Don't need to pay me. Just let me help with food handouts. So it's been a fun ride. Um, it, uh, yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm starting and scaling most of the time this project right now. We are currently in California, lobbying in Germany and Australia for the same law, uh, changes in law um, and, and hopefully, um, yeah, growing fast. Okay, now I'm going to try and bring this back to Yoko. I was the first Yoko investor and first home buyer, um, and I often get asked this question, why did I decide to do that? When I first learned about Yoko, it, was, it didn't exist, it was an idea. Um, so long story, I met Liran through Passright, his previous um, immigration company that helps entrepreneurs like me get US, US visas in the stupid US visa system. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, he, anyway, Liran um, kind of had a small burnout, came down to Costa Rica, told me, hey, this is a really interesting place, um, why don't you come down? I'm thinking about doing a project here. So I came down to Santa Teresa for the first time early in the pandemic, in the very early pandemic. And so at this point, something that I noticed was um, I lived in San Francisco, New York. I, most of my friends started leaving San Francisco, New York. They tried to fulfill this dream of working from paradise, moving to Hawaii, moving to Puerto Rico, moving to Mexico. And um, I found most of them returning after a few months. Once the honeymoon phase of, oh my God, I'm on a beach and I'm working from my laptop is over, People tended to return, and the reason that I found was they couldn't find a community that they truly connected with. They couldn't find people that, you know, inspired them, that did similar things to them, that kind of, you know, I don't know, creatives around them. Like, I, I love being around people who work on crazy stuff, and it really inspires me. And so most of them came back. Um, so at the same time, I mean, there was a kind of a few kind of macro aspects, which, you know, we're probably all aware of. Work was becoming more remote. This is a pre-existing trend. Um, the line between working and traveling is generally blurring, all of these things. Uh, I mean, you know, and, and I looked at Costa Rica and I was like, before I went on the flight, I remember, I was like, okay, this is a great place. It's the safest country in Latin America. A few hours away. Time zone is great for US and Canada. Uh, this makes sense. But ultimately... Um, coming back to my leading principles at this point. How do I feel about, how does this fit in line with ecology, caring for our planet, and giving back to communities? So I felt a big opportunity in both, in your core, I saw. Um, an example, how do we preserve our global ecology? How can we just apply this to your core? Well, I don't know if maybe some of you don't know, parts of South, of Yoko South, were actually, used to be primary rainforest and were cut down by cattle farmers, which is very common in Latin America, lots of parts of Latin America. Um, so how can we do our part? Well, I think other than building sustainably and intruding on the environment the least, I think we have an obligation to try and reforest as much as we can, to turn it into what it once was. Um, Community, giving back to others within the community and outside of it. Creating a community from scratch is a really unique opportunity to figure out what are actually your values and what do you care about, like Shamin said. And I think it, it's an amazing opportunity, not just to find, to create a community with, you know, values that we align with, but also to help each other, to support each other, whatever we might be doing, whether we are retiring or starting companies or you know, going through transitions in life, um, but also help others outside of our community. Um, uh, yeah, in, in, you know, neighboring communities in Santa Teresa and beyond, I think we have a unique opportunity. What was for me the, the main reason why I decided to join Yoko and invest at the crazy early stage? Um, I'm also a venture partner in a venture capital fund. Um, so I get 
hundreds of startups and ideas being pitched every year. And uh, in my venture capital fund, we invest in very early startups, pre-seed and seed. And um, at that early stage, which is really what it was at the time, um, my investment thesis is very simple, actually. I don't invest in ideas, I invest in people. Why is that? Any project that I've been part of, whether it was as a founder, as an investor, as an advisor, will inevitably come up with all kinds of challenges that will change completely the trajectory of the project at many times. Um, but from my experience, which ones are the ones that succeed, which are the ones that I invest in, it's the ones where I feel like the team has what it takes to navigate that, it has the drive to make it happen in the end. No matter what roadblocks come along, no matter how much the like, the whole project is gonna change. And so I remember when I first came down and looking at the, ooh, nice, sorry. Sorry, looking at the team of Yoko now, it's much bigger than it was at the time, but Actually, to answer this question, do I think the team has what it takes to make this happen in Costa Rica, to build an eco-village from scratch? Actually, the answer was quite simple to me. It was yes. Why? Because it's authentic. Because this is a team where, whether you're a team member of Yoko, whether you're an investor, whether you buy a house, whether you buy land, you're building a community for yourself. Everyone wants this to be their future and their future community. This is not a product we're selling to someone else. This is supposed to be their community. This is a very big difference. And so for me, that was really the main reason why I decided to say yes is, hey, these are people that are, that are wanting to build their own community, not build it for someone else, but be part of it and have this their future and you know, kind of live happily ever after in this beautiful community. And so this was really the main, um, the main thing that got me to be excited about Yoko, to be the first person to say yes. Um, and it's been a crazy ride and fun ride since then. <laughs> and with that, I am finished. Thank you very much. <laughs>